uh, the, the subject is uh, about the building of a revolutionary international, which is what we are engaged in. And uh, I will try to explain a little bit about uh, the history and the traditions and the origins of the international Marxist tendency. But I wanted to start by explaining why do we need a revolutionary uh, organization, why do we need a revolutionary party or, or a tendency, and what kind of a party or organization do we, do we need, going back all the way to Marx himself, that is the main, main theme of this uh, uh, school. Obviously, comrades uh, know that Marx famously said in his uh, 11th thesis on, on Feuerbach, he said that uh, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to transform it. So I, mean, I think that that uh, explains the, the revolutionary character of Marxism. Marxism is not just a uh, set of ideas, a method of analysis that allows us to interpret uh, reality, to understand the processes that are going on in society, in uh, natural sciences, in uh, human uh, thinking and, and so on. It is, a, it is, a, it, this is for a reason, and the reason is to transform uh, society, to be able to intervene in these uh, processes and, uh, and change uh, society fu fundamentally. So this is uh, the basic uh, uh, essence of, of Marxism as a re revolutionary theory. The other crucial point that Marx established is what, what is the agency of this uh, change. And he clearly, from starting from a scientific analysis of capitalist society, he explained that it is the working class that has to carry out socialist transformation of uh, society. And that unlike all other transformations, once the working class becomes uh, the ruling class, uh, classes will cease to exist. Because this, this is not a case of a minority exploiting the majority. This is the, the majority taking power and taking control over, over society, the, the working class being the majority of, of society. And he explained this. The role of the working class in, in, the, in the necessary leading role of the working class in a revolutionary process, in, in revolutionary, the socialist revolution, not, not from a sentimental uh, point of view that we like to see working people striking all together and going on, on the barricades, but from, from a scientific analysis of how capitalist society works and the particular role that the working class play in, in, uh, in a capitalist society. And this applies even to uh, revolutions which took place in countries where the working class was not even necessarily the majority of uh, society by any stretch of imagination, like the Russian Revolution, where the working class was a small uh, uh, minority. But the working class in capitalist society is the class that makes everything uh, work, that produces all uh, wealth, that makes society uh, uh, develop. And is the only class that, because of their particular position in the production uh, process, can develop a socialist, a collective consciousness, because they they uh, relate to the owners of the means of production as a collective, uh, working together, producing together. No worker is the sole uh, responsible for the production of anything that they produce as a, as a collective. When they start to move, they move in a collective uh, uh, in a collective way. The other, I think, very important point that Marx uh, made is that, uh, and this is in the, in the statutes of the first uh, international, that the emancipation of the working class is the task of the working class itself. So there's no uh, outside uh, agency that's going to come to bring uh, uh, the working class to, to power from, from outside. It's the workers themselves that carry out a, uh, a uh, revolution. And this is also a very important uh, point. And Marx and uh, Engels spent a lot of time getting involved in the workers' movement of the time as it existed. And the reason for this is because they understood that it's only in the process of uh, entering into struggle, even for the basic, uh, most basic demands, trade union demands, uh, the, the shortening of the working week, the increase in, in wages is through this process of struggle that the workers realize two things. One, the limitations of reforms 
within the, the framework of the capitalist system, and two, and, and perhaps mo most uh, important, their own strength as a collective uh, body, their own strength as a class, and they become aware of their role in a society, and they develop political uh, consciousness. And this is, uh, this is also an, another very important uh, uh, point that Marx made, made about uh, this. And he said that uh, in the German ideology, this is a hand, handwritten uh, quote, I hope I'll be able to read it, but it says, but Marx uh, said that both for the production on a mass scale of communist consciousness and for the success of the cause itself, uh, the al the al the al the al no, I can't read it. Uh, the the alteration on a mass scale is necessary. An alteration which can only the alteration of of men on a mass scale is necessary. An alteration which can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. It, it says basically that. Uh, as he explained uh, elsewhere, social being determines consciousness. And it is changes in these uh, conditions of uh, living that change people's consciousness. And that the only way in which uh, you can have a, a mass socialist uh, consciousness is through the process of revolution itself. That is, a revolution is not only necessary, he, he explains, because it's the only way to overcome the resistance of the ruling class, but also because it's the only way in which uh, a mass of uh, working people can develop socialist uh, consciousness and, 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 uh, and the consciousness of the need of uh, a fundamental uh, transformation through their own experience. But someone might uh, say, well, if consciousness develops through experience, uh, there's no need for a revolutionary uh, party. Why, why should we organize if workers in, in, an, in a linear, uh, development in a, in a process over a period of time, over a certain uh, number of trade union struggles and so on, will eventually develop a political consciousness, will, will create their own organizations, and will we'll get to a socialist uh, revolution. So why uh, do we need a political party or, 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 uh, or revolutionary uh, leadership? And, and the reason for this <coughs> is also because the way, uh, the way class consciousness and ideology develops is not a linear uh, process. It's, it's not that all workers uh, develop from 10% uh, socialist consciousness to then 15% to then 20% when they finally understand the full, uh, in, in full, the need for a socialist revolution. Then there is a socialist revolution, and everybody agrees. Uh, this is not the way things work. This is actually a very un-Marxist uh, approach to the to the question. Consciousness develops in a, in a dialectical uh, way, through leaps and, uh, and bounds. And most people, in normal uh, times, tend to cling, conscious being a very conservative uh, uh, factor, tend to cling to what is known, to what they've always uh, known, to what is uh, reliable, to what uh, can be trusted. Uh, and they're not very fond of uh, big, uh, of big uh, changes. Plus, as, as Marx also explained, the dominant ideology in any society is the, the ideology of the, of the ruling uh, class, which is uh, transmitted, um, reproduced, and uh, instilled into the minds of uh, millions of people through many different uh, ways, through the education system, through the family, through the church, all the institutions of uh, capitalist society, the mass media, uh, and so on. They transmit and, uh, and instill a uh, 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 conservative uh, mentality, a uh, consciousness of, uh, well, I mean, maybe even things are not so, so good, but this is the best system that there is, there is no alternative. Things have always been like this, they have always been rich and, and, uh, and poor, and this is what we need to, uh, to accept, and this is nothing, there's no point in trying to, to change it. And uh, consciousness, e even though there, there might be big transformations in the conditions of living of, of uh, working people, Consciousness only catches up in, in a revolutionary way, precisely at these particular times. In, in revolutions, wars, big events make uh, people's uh, ideas change in a fundamental uh, way. Also, uh, it is not the case that the consciousness of all different sections in society changes at the same time. The working class is composed of more advanced elements, more backward elements, 
uh, backward elements can become more advanced in, in the course of, uh, of big uh, battles. So for all these uh, reasons, a revolutionary leadership, revolutionary vanguard, is, uh, is uh, needed. And what is the relationship of this uh, vanguard to the class as a whole, to the movement as a whole? And I think that this is uh, brilliantly explained in the Communist uh, Manifesto already, which is one of the founding documents of revolutionary uh, Marxism. <clears throat> and here again is a long quote, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't find the book. I thought it was going to be on uh, sale. Is it? I better read it from uh, there. No, anyway, I'll read it from here. <laughs> uh, it's a long quote, it's handwritten, uh, and my handwriting is not that good. But, uh, but there is a section in the Communist Manifesto where Marx explains, Marx and Engels explain in detail w what is the relationship of the Communist Party or the Communist uh, leadership to the, workers as a, to the workers' movement as a whole. And this is one of the most misunderstood uh, parts of the Communist Manifesto, one of the parts of, of uh, what Marx said that many people who call themselves Marxists that are around uh, today have uh, not uh, understood uh, uh, at all. And it says, communists do not form a separate party opposed to the other working class parties. They have no interest separate and apart from the proletariat as a whole. They do not set up any sectarian principles of their own by which to shape and mold the proletarian movement. I, I, it's, very, it's very clear what he's saying. It's, it's not that socialists or communist revolutionary Marxists come from outside and try to shape the working class uh, movement. He says the communists are distinguished from other working class parties by this only. In one, in the national struggles, they point out and bring to the front the common interests of the entire proletariat. So here you have uh, one, one uh, important uh, point. In the, various, in the various stages of development, uh, um, in the various stages of development which the struggle of the working class against the bourgeois class uh, pass, has to pass through, they always and everywhere represent the the interests of the movement as a whole. I this is not uh, the, the communists uh, try to bring to every single struggle, even if it's just struggle in one factory or in one uh, region, or in one particular industry, the interest of the workers as, as, a, as a whole. The communists, therefore, are on the one hand the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of any country, that which, which pushes all others forward. And, and on the, uh, uh, so it's clear that in any, any particular struggle, the, the communists try to bring the struggle to its logical conclusion, to its most advanced uh, development to achieve the most, uh, the, the bigger part of its uh, aims uh, of the struggle in itself. And on the other hand, theoretically, they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, the conditions, and the ultimate general results of the proletarian movement. That is, that uh, uh, is, is very clear that the communists are not apart from the working class movement. They are, they are one section of the working class movement that can see further, that can see the final aims, and that in, in every single struggle, however small or big, try to bring these interests to, to, the, to the fore. This is very uh, important because in here, Marx is explaining basically the, the concept of a vanguard uh, party, the concept of the need for a revolutionary uh, uh, leadership, which then later on uh, Lenin and, 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 uh, other, uh, and others developed Develop, uh, <coughs> develop further and, and also in, uh, in practice. Re revolutions, there, therefore, are carried out by, by, the, mass, by the mass of workers uh, themselves. They're not carried out by the revolutionaries. The revolutionary party's task is not to make a revolution, but to make sure that this revolution reaches its final uh, uh, victorious uh, conclusion. But at the same time, it's also important to, to understand that because this process of cons changes in consciousness during revolutionary periods takes place so quickly, and revolutions do not last for a very long uh, period of uh, time. They last for a few months, perhaps for a few uh, years. We now have the very peculiar uh, example of the Venezuelan revolution, which uh, in its process it has lasted for 12 uh, uh, years. Uh, 
or, or even uh, longer, but this is uh, an, an anomaly which has for, for particular reasons. But you take, for instance, the, the Russian uh, Revolution, 1917, lasted for about a period of nine months, one, one year of intense revolutionary activity. Spanish Revolution in the 1930s lasted for about uh, six years, from 1931 to 1937, approximately. The German Revolution in uh, 1918 lasted for three, four, five, five years, perhaps, of intense revolutionary activity. Different uh, groups and classes coming to the fore, different movements being defeated, different uh, leaders being put to the test. But this is in a very compressed period of time. And it is impossible, it's physically, materially impossible, for the masses as a whole to draw all the necessary conclusions, to put all the leaderships to the test, uh, and uh, improvise in the course of the revolution a new revolutionary leadership which is uh, needed and, and necessary for that, uh, for that period. There is a very good, um, there is a very good quote from uh, Trotsky, there's two, two very good quotes from Trotsky, and uh, that explain this, this idea of the relationship of the revolutionary vanguard and the mass of uh, workers in a period of, of revolution. One is from uh, the history of the Russian uh, Revolution, a book which is uh, highly recommended. It's not uh, only uh, an excellent history of the Russian Revolution, describing the processes as they uh, develop the different uh, groups and forces involved the different material conditions, but also it's excellently uh, written. It reads like, uh, like a novel that grips you in, in its uh, uh, in, uh, it brings you the excitement of, of, the, of the times by, by reading it. And he says, uh, Trotsky says in that uh, book, says, without a guiding organization, the energy of the masses will dissipate like steam not enclosed in a piston box. But nevertheless, and he adds this uh, point, uh, what moves things is not the piston or the box, but the steam i.e. the masses make the, the revolution, the role of the, of the leadership, the role of the revolutionary leadership is to direct this energy, uh, basing themselves on the experience of past revolutions, uh, as Marx says, on a theoretical understanding of the ultimate goal of such a, a movement, to direct and crystallize the energy of the masses in the short period of time when they are in revolutionary fervor, in the right uh, direction to be able to ensure uh, victory. Those lessons cannot be uh, cannot be improvised. Trotsky also says in another very uh, recommended uh, pamphlet, short pamphlet that he wrote right at the end of his life, called "The Class, the Party, and uh, the Leadership," when he was uh, on the basis of explaining the defeat of the Spanish Revolution, he was trying to draw some general conclusions about the relationship between the working class the leadership, the party, and, and so on, which is also very recommended. It's not very, not very long, it's a short uh, pamphlet. He says, during, during a revolution, a weak party can quickly grow into a mighty one, provided it lucidly understands the cause of, of the revolution and, and <coughs> reserves a staunch cadres that do not become intoxicated with phrases. But such a party must be available prior to the revolution. This is the important point. It cannot be improvised in the course of the, of the revolution. Inasmuch as the process of education, educating the cadres requires a considerable period of time, and the revolution does not afford this time. That is, uh, Trotsky has explained that uh, the revolutionary leadership is initially composed of cadres, i.e. people who are educated in the ideas of uh, Marxism, who understand uh, the way capitalist society works, the way the class struggle uh, works, and that are also rooted in the working class uh, movement in one way or, or another, that they are known to the mass of uh, workers in the factory where they work, in the working class neighborhood where they, where they are active, uh, and that this cannot be uh, improvised in the course of the, of the revolution. And there are, as a matter of fact, some very good positive and negative examples of, this, of these questions that we, we just uh, explained. And uh, I, will, I will say that two very good examples of this are, on the one hand, the Russian Revolution, on the other hand, the German uh, Revolution. In the Russian uh, Revolution, you, you could say, uh, and Trotsky says in class party and leadership, you could say, what, what was the level of maturity 
of the Russian workers in February 1917. And he says, this is the wrong question to, to ask. He says, in, if you want to take it as it was, February 1917, the overwhelming majority of Russian uh, workers were supporting the social patriots, the social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, all the reformist tendencies. The, the Bolshevik party, i.e. the revolutionary organization, was extremely small and isolated, represented only a very small uh, number of workers and a very small number of workers followed <coughs> the, the advice of the party. And the party itself was divided and uh, was following the wrong uh, line at that particular point in, in February. So, uh, but the point is that a party existed, a party of cadres that had been trained over a period of time in the experience of 1905 in, in a whole number of different types of uh, experiences, fighting against other currents within the movement, fighting against anarchist terrorist tendencies, fighting against the idea that maybe the peasantry was the, was the agency of the revolution and so on. And uh, these cadres uh, had uh, become rooted in the movement. They were known to a layer of, uh, of uh, people. And uh, with, the, with the return of uh, Lenin in, uh, in April, which also, also played a crucial uh, role in, 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 the, in, in the revolution, the party was able to reorient uh, uh, itself. And basing, basing itself on these cadres, then they, they became from a very small party, maybe 8,000. This is the figures commonly uh, given in uh, February, 8,000 uh, members, to a party of perhaps 250,000 by uh, October, taking uh, power. And not only this, obviously the period between February and, and October is the period in which the Bolsheviks become uh, the party that is supported by the overwhelming majority, not only of the most advanced elements, but the overwhelming majority of the workers, the peasants, and the soldiers that identify uh, their interests with uh, the, the demands of the, of the of the, of the party, that is all power to the, to the Soviets. Uh, this was possible because of the, all this preparatory <coughs> work, patient work of building the, building the cadres, of uh, educating and training the cadres, not, not only on the basis of theoretical discussions, but also intervention in the concrete class uh, struggle. As a matter of fact, in January 1917, uh, Lenin was addressing a meeting of the Young Socialists in uh, Switzerland and he was uh, not very optimistic about the prospects of the Russian Revolution, which were, were not very promising at that particular time. He said, the task of uh, carrying out the revolution is, is, is down to you, the new generation. Our, our generation won't, won't even see it. A few months later he was taking power in, uh, in uh, Russia. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that in January they apparently were very isolated. Uh, but all the preparatory work then paid in the revolutionary situation. The party became a, a big uh, organization that was able to lead the working class to uh, power on the basis of having, on the one hand, correct theoretical uh, understanding, trained Marxist uh, cadres that were able to orient themselves in the, in the situation. Uh, cadres that had known each other, there was a confidence, a trust in, in the leadership that they uh, had, and they were rooted in the working class uh, movement. They had a clear, a clear idea about that. The German Revolution, on the other hand, a country where the proletariat was, m was much more stronger in terms of uh, numbers, uh, social weight, the organizations it uh, possessed, and so on, was nevertheless uh, defeated over a period of four or five uh, years. And the main reason you could say for, for that was that they did, it did, they, there was no revolutionary leadership, there was no cadre organization that had been trained and educated prior to, to that before, beforehand. Uh, Rosa Luxemburg and, and Karl Liebknecht, Liebknecht made a, a, an enormous contribution to the revolutionary movement in Germany, but the one thing, that particularly Rosa Luxemburg, uh, did not uh, understand, did not fully uh, develop, was the need for the revolutionary tendency within the, the German so social democracy to organize itself separately as a clear, distinct tendency uh, with its own uh, ideas and with its own inter uh, organized intervention in the, in the movement. And they paid a big price for, for this. The, the party, cannot, the leadership cannot be improvised and it needs to be in existence prior to the revolutionary events, as, as Trotsky uh, uh, stresses here. 
Um, and this brings me to, to another, another point, the point of uh, the fact that the, the Second International, which was composed of mass uh, parties and formally adhered to Marxist ideas, socialism, that you need to transform society, became, uh, was put to the test in the First uh, World War and failed that test. And, uh, and the Russian Revolution uh, showed that these parties all sided with, uh, with uh, the, bu the bourgeois camp. They all supported the imperialist uh, war. And only a small minority in each one of these uh, parties defended genuine Marxist internationalist ideas instead of falling in line behind the, the German uh, bourgeoisie or the French bourgeoisie or the different national bourgeoisies in the First World War. Uh, and it's, in, it's interesting, I think it's important to see how the Third International was created out of the, of the Second. The Third International was not created in 1914, which is when the betrayal took place. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1914, 1915, 1916, it was a very small minority that uh, defended genuine ideas of uh, Marxism. And although they were pre preparing for creating a new international, and, and Lenin had already announced the need for a new international in 1914, 1915, the new international was not created until uh, after the Russian uh, uh, Revolution. The reason for this is because things that might be clear to a small layer of advanced uh, revolutionaries, not necessarily clear or understood by the mass of workers, which learn mainly through big events, through big uh, shocks, and uh, also by positive uh, experience. It was only when the Bolsheviks were, were able to demonstrate that they could take uh, power in Russia, and this had a big impact throughout the socialist uh, movement uh, worldwide, that then they decided it's now the time, we have now the forces, the necessary uh, forces to create a new uh, international, which was, in the main, created out of mass splits of the old social democratic uh, organizations. In many cases, it was a majority split. For instance, in the case of the French party, uh, which voted in 1920, was it 21 or 22, at the Congress, 20. in 1920, at the Congress of, uh, of Tours, they voted uh, overwhelmingly to join the new uh, Communist International. Or the Czech uh, uh, party also <coughs> voted by a majority to join the new International. Even, although it's not very well uh, known, in Spain, uh, the Socialist Party voted to join the, the new uh, International. And even the CNT, an anarcho-syndicalist revolutionary trade union, voted to join the Communist International. Then it didn't. Uh, but that's a different uh, story, but it just shows you the impact of one victory in one country uh, in, in, the, in the working class movement throughout uh, uh, the world. And on this basis, the new international was, was, uh, was, uh, was built and was developed. <coughs> and then uh, uh, in the first period of the new uh, communist international, Lenin uh, and, and Trotsky dedicated a lot of time to fight against ultra-left moods and tendencies that existed within the international. People who thought, uh, well, listen, we have the example of the, the, the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks uh, <coughs> took power. The Soviets took power in uh, <coughs> Russia. We must do the same in our countries, regardless of the conditions. And they basically said, well, we shouldn't participate in parliaments because Soviets are much uh, superior. We shouldn't participate in trade union struggle because this is reformist, we need, we need to fight for power and revolution. And, and, uh, and Lenin had to correct and discuss with all these different trends, which were quite prevalent in, in the British party, for instance, in the German party, and in, in the Dutch party, and in other places, to fight, to, to explain that the first task, or nine-tenths of the task of the revolution is to win over the majority of the working class to the idea of, of uh, the need for, for, for social transformation. It's not, it's not, uh, it is wrong to think that a uh, small vanguard, and in these cases, uh, in, in the 1930s, we're talking about a lot of people, tens of thousands of people followed the ultra-left uh, communists. In uh, Germany, for instance, and these were industrial uh, workers. They were not uh, uh, radicalized uh, students. They were industrial uh, workers who were affected by these uh, moods. And, uh, but nevertheless, they needed to carry out the task, and Lenin insisted, of winning over the mass of workers and, 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 uh, and working with them wherever they, they went. And here, in uh, left-wing uh, communism, is when 
Lenin, for instance, advised the British Communist uh, Party, which was very uh, sm small at that uh, time, to join the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. He explained that there's uh, tens of thousands in the Communist uh, Party, perhaps thousands in the Communist Party, <coughs> advanced uh, workers, uh, but there are millions in the trade unions, and the trade union's political expression is the Labour Party. You need to, to go and discuss with these uh, workers, to expose their leaders, but not just in propaganda, but also in uh, words, i.e. what, what uh, Marx had said, that in every struggle the communists must be those who are most decided to bring the struggle forward in the most, uh, in the most uh, consistent uh, uh, way, and in this way expose the limitations of the reformist uh, uh, leadership. This was a very important part, and also the struggle for the, for the united uh, front, which is basically the same thing. Even in countries, where there were, where there were mass uh, communist parties, but these communist parties were perhaps smaller than the social democratic parties, or the social democratic parties still retain uh, the loyalty of a big section of the working class, uh, the communists should address themselves to these uh, parties, propose a united front to fight for, for the immediate demands of the, of the workers, in order to be able to win over the, the mass of workers that were involved in these uh, organizations. <clears throat> now, for reasons which are not uh, the subject of this uh, discussion, the Communist International also de 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 degenerated in, uh, in uh, Stalinist bureaucratic uh, uh, lines. Let's just say, for, for the purpose of this discussion, that this also led to a nationalist uh, degeneration of all these uh, parties, instead of, of the aim of the Communist International being the attainment of socialism uh, worldwide, i.e. the most general aims of the movement, as Marx uh, put it, uh, it became the defense of the Soviet uh, Union, which was not even a, a healthy worker state, it was a degenerated uh, Stalinist uh, dictatorship. And, and all, all, everything else was subordinate to the, inter to the narrow interest of the, of the Russian uh, bureaucracy, including the Spanish uh, civil war, for instance, where they played a completely tre tre treacherous uh, role. But, but uh, what we're interested here is that uh, Trotsky was the one who fought against this uh, degeneration in the most consistent way, giving it a political explanation, explaining why it had happened and what was the alternative. And again, as it happened many, many times in history, revolutionary Marxists were reduced to very small numbers. And in this particular case, they were also isolated from uh, the general movement of the, of the class. The first task that uh, Trotsky set himself was the pr preservation of the cadres, the preservation of the ideas, theory, uh, i.e. He, he, uh, he, he did give a, a theoretical explanation for the degeneration of the, of the Soviet uh, Union, he wrote Revolution uh, Betrayed, which is also very uh, recommended, a must uh, uh, read for all comrades, and he tried to preserve the cadres uh, in very difficult uh, circumstances, where, when it was not only a question of uh, a struggle for ideas or a battle of different points of view, the Stalinist bureaucracy was using uh, physical force, the elimination, uh, massive elimination of political opponents as, a, as a, an instrument of, of the political uh, struggle. So it was very, very uh, extremely difficult uh, times, and this was the main task of Trotsky: preservation of the case, preservation of the ideas, even though he, he was very, very uh, isolated. He first formed the left uh, opposition, and <coughs> in the British, in, in Britain, <coughs> the, the British section of uh, the left uh, opposition, which then uh, went through different uh, splits and uh, divisions and so on. But there was an organization, the Workers' International League, which then became the Revolutionary Communist Party, that was led by people like Ted Grant, mainly, but, uh, but also uh, uh, others. And this, I would say, is where we can trace the origins of the international Marxist tendency. Uh, I.e., not only to uh, the British uh, left opposition, the British uh, Trotskyists in the 1930s and 40s, but the British Trotskyists obviously were the continuation of revolutionary Marxism all the way back to uh, Marx, the Communist Manifesto, and, and, and so on. This is, this is the tradition of the international Marxist tendency where, where we uh, uh, come from. The, if, you, if you read History of British uh, Trotskyism, not a very recommended uh, book, you will see that uh, what the British Trotskyists built in the 1930s, and particularly in the, in the early 1940s, was a really uh, successful organization with roots in the most advanced sections of the working class, 
in conditions which were not uh, easy. I mean, some, some anecdotes in that uh, book, for instance, when they were attempting to sell the paper, their paper putting forward a point of view outside Conway Hall at the meeting called by the Communist Party, they were physically prevented from doing so, and they had to defend uh, themselves. Now today, I don't think there's any, any place in Britain you're going to be uh, physically uh, beaten up by another uh, organization of the world class for selling your paper. Julian thinks that there might be one. But I'm just saying that uh, at that time, the Communist Party, which had uh, the, the aurea, the, the, the tradition of uh, Lenin uh, and the Russian uh, Revolution, had, had a lot of respect and authority amongst advanced industrial workers, physically preventing the, the trotskys from even engaging in any uh, discussion. And they built an organization that was very successful, that built roots amongst the most advanced sections of the working uh, class during the, during the war. And that, uh, just to give you an indication, had a paper with a circulation of perhaps 10, 15,000 uh, uh, copies, even though the organization was much smaller than, uh, than that of a few, uh, a few hundred. So, so it just gives you uh, an idea. And this was built on the basis, I would say, of two things. One, firm uh, theoretical principles in transitions in the, on the uh, ideas, and also a clear orientation towards the working uh, class of trying to uh, present the ideas, trying to explain the ideas in a way that the working class could uh, understand, as opposed to the sectarianism of other so-called Trotskyist groups that existed at the time in, uh, in uh, Britain. It is also the case <coughs> that, that particular, uh, at that particular time, one of, one of the things in the 1930s that Trotsky insisted was he, he was uh, extreme, we was very um, concerned about finding a way for the small uh, cadres that had remained uh, together, for, the, for them to find a way to the working uh, class. And when he saw there was radicalization, in the social uh, democracy in a whole number of countries, in France, in, in uh, Spain, also in, uh, in, uh, in Britain, in uh, the United States. He didn't hesitate in, in uh, proposing what was first known as the left, uh, as the French uh, term, sending the small forces of Marxism into the socialist social democratic organizations that were in turmoil in order to win the best of these uh, uh, people to the ideas of revolutionary Marxism in, ex in, in extreme uh, flexible, uh, tactical flex flexibility. Um, I have to fast forward uh, a bit because my time is, uh, is running out. Not running out, but it's uh, going faster than what I, uh, than what I thought. But, um, but uh, uh, there, there's another important uh, point and this is that uh, Trotsky in 1938 uh, finally uh, proposed the building of, of a, another international, fourth international. And he wrote another very recommended uh, pamphlet called, uh, called the Transitional uh, Program, which was the founding manifesto of the fourth uh, international. And, and in it, it says a very interesting uh, idea, which I think is, is very relevant today. He says, the crisis of uh, humanity is the crisis of its revolutionary leadership. He describes the period, the period of capitalist, acute capitalist crisis, the danger of uh, threat of fascism. And he says the conditions are ripe, perhaps overripe, for socialist transformation. What is missing is that there is no leadership with uh, roots in the, in the class with an authority that is proposing uh, that. And our task is to accelerate that, uh, that process as much as we uh, can. In reality, one could say that the basis for forming a new international did not exist in the sense that this international was not composed of mass parties that had uh, proven themselves in any particular country. But uh, Trotsky thought that it was necessary to build the international at that time because in the process of the, of the, of the, of the crisis of capitalism, the intense class battles that were being prepared and were taking place, the international could grow and become a mass uh, force. And that he was his uh, perspective, that out of the Second World War, the Fourth International will become a mass uh, force. And the old organizations, having uh, social democracy and Stalinism, having been put to the test, will be basically destroyed. Uh, this perspective was falsified, as we uh, know, for, for, other, for reasons that we won't go into any detail, but, but the outcome of the Second World War was uh, completely different. There was a revolutionary upsurge in many uh, countries, in, in Italy, in France, in Greece particularly, but also in Britain with the returning uh, soldiers demanding uh, uh, 
socialism. Uh, but this was betrayed by the Stalinist and reformist leaderships in different uh, countries. And a period of st stabilization um, and ensued after, after that, which lasted for, which lasted for a few uh, decades. In, in that period, the forces of genuine Marxism, again, were very uh, isolated. But, but they were also isolated for another reason, and that is that the leadership of the Fourth International, uh, all of them, uh, Mandel, Pablo, Cannon, uh, all of the different leaders uh, of the Fourth International, after the death of uh, Trotsky, were completely unable to uh, analyze the situation that had uh, developed and had uh, changed uh, quite a lot from what Trotsky had uh, predicted. And instead of uh, at least preserving the cadence in what was in what was a difficult uh, situation, they tried to look for all sorts of shortcuts. Uh, they, they had uh, illusions that uh, Mao was somehow an unconscious uh, Trotskyist, or Tito in Yugoslavia was an unconscious Trotskyist, or, or that the students were the, the vanguard of the revolution, or that the colonial revolution was the, the way forward. E e all and everything but the working, uh, but the working class. Uh, and so they departed from one of the fundamental uh, uh, tenets of, of uh, Marxism, and as a result they made all sorts of uh, mistakes. And because they made all sorts of mistakes, they also had to impose a bureaucratic regime within the, the international. They were unable, unwilling to correct these mistakes, to admit these mistakes. And, they, uh, and the result of this is that the, the group around Ted Grant, the leadership of the British section of the Fourth International, was subject to all sorts of maneuvers, uh, tricks, bureaucratic uh, splits and, and so on, they were expelled from the Fourth International on at least uh, two or three different uh, occasions for, for, the, for the crime of proposing an alternative uh, point of view, an oppositional point of view, which in fact coincided much more uh, closely with uh, the development of, uh, of reality. That's also a long uh, story, but in the, in the early 1960s, uh, the, the, the Marxist uh, tendency around uh, Ted Grant finally managed to uh, sink roots in the movement uh, uh, again and build what was in effect the most successful Trotskyist organization that has ever existed outside of the Russian uh, left uh, opposition in the, 19, uh, in the 1930s. And this was the militant uh, tendency in this uh, country. And that is also part of our of our history and our and our tradition that we can that we can trace back to. Uh, the militant uh, tendency, I, I will say, was characterized um, perhaps by, by three different crucial uh, points. One, uh, the question of theory. There was an insistence on political discussion and raising the political level of of uh, Congress, i.e., the development of, of cadres, Marxist uh, cadres. Number two was an orientation towards the working uh, class. While all other so-called Trotskyist organizations were playing around with saying, oh, guerrilla, is the, guerrilla struggle is the way forward, or the students are uh, the red basis of uh, proletarian revolution in the universities and other such uh, things, the, the militant uh, tendency was firmly uh, of the opinion that uh, it's a Marxist, basic Marxist idea, I don't know why, why this seems to be so, so difficult to understand, that is the working class that will carry out the revolution, you must orient, must find a way to link the ideas of Marxism with the living movement of the working uh, uh, class. And the third point, I would say, is uh, the youthfulness of the, of the organization. Not that all the members were, were young, Ted Grant was, was no, not young in, in age at that uh, time, obviously, but a clear orientation towards the, the, the youth, which is also <coughs> something which characterized uh, Trotsky in the 1930s. When you read uh, the transitional program, he says uh, the way forward is uh, proletarian women and a proletarian uh, youth, the most oppressed and fresh layers of the, of the class, will give us the cadence that we'll, we need in the, in the future. Uh, and this was also the case with the militant tendency, which at one point uh, gained a majority in the Labour Party Young uh, Socialists and used effectively the, the official uh, youth organization of the movement to penetrate the ranks of the working class in the trade unions, in the Labour Party, local branches, and, and so on. The, the militant developed to an organization of thousands of, uh, of uh, members. 
that uh, led uh, the struggle of the Liverpool uh, Council, for instance, that resisted cuts against uh, Thatcher, something that is worth uh, re-examining in the light of the current situation today, with cuts in being implemented, local labor councils being uh, voting for these uh, cuts and implementing them. Uh, it, it reached a point where it had, uh, the militant tendency had three members of parliament giving, giving a, a big um, audience to the ideas of, uh, of uh, Marxism. And uh, it led the poll tax, uh, the anti poll tax struggle that involved hundreds of thousands of people in direct uh, mobilization and millions of people in, in non payment uh, campaign. That was a crucial factor in bringing down the Thatch uh, uh, government. <coughs> and, the, and this is also uh, part of our tradition, of our uh, heritage. And, and the militant uh, tendency, also, the, the Marxist tendency, also was always internationalist, as in all other previous uh, examples that I have explained, uh, <laughs> part of the work of the militant was the building of an international, which at that time was called Committee for the Workers uh, International, was built, was uh, started in 1974, and it developed throughout, uh, throughout the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, however, this organization also collapsed in 1991-92, precisely because it departed from this main uh, Principles. There was a lowering of the of the level of uh, theory in the in the organization, moving away from the working class, looking for shortcuts. The idea that in a, in what was a difficult period, 1989, the fall of Stalinism, massive propaganda campaign against uh, socialism, that only if you were to raise the banner of the Revolutionary Party, the masses will flock to this uh, idea, which is a completely false idea, and it's been proven in history many many times. It's not a question of proclaiming a revolutionary party, it's a question of linking the ideas of revolutionary Marxism with the living movement as it is of the working uh, uh, class. And, uh, and it is out of these uh, uh, split expulsions within the militant uh, tendency that our organization uh, came out. They, they, they basically expelled the main <coughs> living uh, figures that had contributed to the, the, the theoretical development of that organization. <coughs> Ted Grant, Alan Woods, uh, and, and, uh, and all the Congress were, were expelled. And what, uh, and what did the Marxist tendency do immediately after that became, uh, not, not became, it didn't become isolated to small numbers. We had uh, comrades in a whole number of uh, countries. The situation in the international was, was different. We had sections in, in a whole number of uh, countries. But we, we were reduced to a small uh, group without the mass uh, audience or the influence that the militant had had at one uh, point. And uh, once again, what the Marxist tendency did was to concentrate again on the question of theory. And, and the first, one of the first initiatives taken by the, by the Marxist tendency at that time was the, the writing of uh, <coughs> Prison in Revolt, a book about Marxist uh, philosophy and modern uh, science, which you might think is not particularly relevant to the immediate struggle of the, of the workers, but it is necessary to reestablish the authority of the ideas. And as a matter of fact, this book alone allowed the Marxist tendency to connect and penetrate uh, areas of the workers' movement that were close to us uh, before, particularly amongst the ex-Stalinist uh, organizations. For instance, uh, for, a, for a number of years, Alan Woods was invited to speak as a, as a known Trotskyist uh, writer and, and, and revolutionary, to speak at the National Festival of the Spanish uh, Communist Party, United uh, Left. This is unheard of, I mean, we just mentioned. In the 1930s, the Stalinists will beat you up if you were a Trotsky, you will go anywhere near a meeting. But this time, they were inviting uh, the Marxist tendency to explain, to provide an explanation of what had happened in the, in the, in the Soviet Union uh, and why was it possible to, uh, why, why was socialism still uh, relevant at that uh, time? This is the power of ideas on which this organization is, uh, is based. If I can just give you an anecdote, I was, uh, I was at the meeting with uh, Ted Graham was speaking, at, uh, had a speaking tour in, in, I can't remember exactly the year, but it was in the early 1990s, and he was speaking in a working class district in Madrid, in, in Leganes, and the meeting was, was organized by the local Communist Party and local United Left, and sitting uh, next to um, Ted, presenting the, the meeting was the, the general secretary of the local communist party. This is an, or an organization that had hundreds of members in that uh, working class district. And he, I thought he was going to say a few words at the, at the beginning, where he just stood up and said, well, we all know why we are here. 
we are here to uh, listen to someone who knows much more than uh, I do about the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union and the ideas of uh, Trotsky. And this is Ted Grant. We were launching Russia from revolution to counter revolution. So, so this was a man who, who had been in the, or in the movement for many uh, years, was the leader of the Communist uh, Party. But however, on the basis of what? On the basis of our uh, ideas, we were able to address an audience, a big audience of communist uh, workers. The, the, the same book, Prison and Revolt, also allowed us to connect with the critical mood developing in the Communist Party in, uh, in uh, Cuba. And also was one of the key uh, factors by which we linked ourselves to the Venezuelan uh, Revolution about 10, uh, ten years uh, ago. And uh, we cannot say that this is because the Marxist tendency that, uh, that Chavez declared that the, that the aims of the revolution in Venezuela was, uh, that the aim of the revolution was socialism, but it certainly did play a role. And he recognized it himself. When, when he explained why he uh, made that statement, he said, it's on the basis of my own experience, it's on the basis of uh, books I have read, and, and we know because he publicized uh, the fact that he'd been reading uh, Reason and Revolt and other books by, by this uh, tendency. So it just shows you that uh, if you have uh, sound gra grounding on uh, Marxist uh, theory, you, you are able to explain the ideas in such a way that connect with the living experience, with the living movement of the working uh, class. Today, the international Marxist uh, tendency has sections in 25 different countries around the world and has work in another 10 uh, countries where there are groups not, not fully developed as sections and then has contacts in many other in many other places. We, we are not a mass organization by any stretch of, of imagination. We are a cave organization uh, working in the working class movement as it is in different uh, countries with particular attention to recruiting the best amongst the youth and educating them as Marxist uh, cadres. But some of our organizations in, in different countries, even though not mass organizations, they are of a certain size or have a certain uh, weight and influence within the workers' movement in those uh, countries. In Pakistan, for instance, we have an organization of over 2,000 uh, members spread throughout the whole uh, country, uh, involving all the different national uh, groups comprised of uh, youth uh, workers, but also we have peasant uh, work, is also comprised of women in a, city, in, in a country where it's very difficult for women to get involved in, in any political uh, work. And it's an organization that's working in extremely complex uh, circumstances, defending the Marxist, uh, the ideas of uh, Marxism <coughs> as the only way uh, uh, forward. And, um, and finally, my last point will be that uh, we, we are already in a, in a situation where there is capitalist crisis throughout uh, Europe and changes are already operating in the consciousness of millions of, uh, of people. M more so in countries where the capitalist crisis is more acute, like in Greece or in Spain, Italy, Portugal. Uh, but also in other countries, uh, people start uh, thinking, why, why is this uh, happening? Why is it that we are in a recession, that we can't come out of it? And that the rich keep getting uh, richer while the working class is paying for this uh, capitalist crisis. This is the, the precondition for big changes in consciousness. There's a questioning of the capitalist uh, system uh, amongst broad layers of the population. And there's a growing interest in the ideas of uh, Marxism. It is in these conditions that if we have built the necessary cadres, we can become a bigger uh, organization, an organization that can uh, f struggle for the leadership of the working class movement, which is already taking uh, uh, place. In, uh, in, uh, in Russia, as I said, the, 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 the revolutionary Marxists went from being 8,000 to 250,000 in a short space of time. Another example of this is in, uh, in uh, Spain, for instance, the poll, which was not fully revolutionary Marxist uh, party, which made uh, many blunders and uh, mistakes, but nevertheless was seen as the far left, the most uh, revolutionary of the different organizations that existed in Spain, went from uh, 2000 in uh, June 1936 to an organization of 80,000 in uh, the space of six uh, weeks. Uh, in the process of revolution, if you have built prior to that the necessary cadres trained in theory and rooted in the working class, a small organization can become very quickly a big organization. And this is what we want to uh, build with the international uh, uh, 
Marxist uh, tendency. Okay, it was an interesting uh, discussion. Some interesting points were <coughs> were made. Uh, I'd like to start with with one uh, clarification. That, in my, my opinion, and I tried to explain this in the in the introduction, <coughs> the concept of a, van a vanguard party or the need for revolutionary leadership doesn't doesn't come from Lenin. It's, I mean, they try sometimes to say, you know, this is a Leninist thing. Has nothing to do with Marxism, or as Marx understood it. But Marx actually is is the one who, who posed the need for that in the Communist Manifesto. You can see it. There, there needs to be a group of communists. They need to be organized part of the movement, but putting forward the most advanced ideas, the more general theoretical framework, and that, that push the movement to its logical uh, conclusion. This is revolutionary uh, vanguard or revolutionary leadership, if you want to call it like that. So that idea comes from uh, from uh, Lenin. Sorry, so from Marx, not 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 a separate idea from uh, from uh, Lenin. Although obviously Lenin contributed to developing this idea, putting it in uh, practice, went through the experience of the Russian uh, Revolution, building up these, those initial nucleuses and, and so on. And uh, in relation to the French uh, Revolution, I wouldn't say the French Revolution ended up with the terror and the guillotine. The French Revolution started with the guillotine. And that was a very good uh, start. It was a clean break with the past. It was <laughs> represented <laughs> by the physical separation of the king's head from the, from the, from the body. But this question of, of violence, <laughs> This question of violence and, and revolution is one that is always thrown at revolutionaries. It says, oh, you want uh, you bloodthirsty people, you want the uh, uh, violence to happen while, uh, while now everything is uh, fine and there's no uh, violence. First of all, there's plenty of violence in normal, everyday uh, capitalist uh, society. Not one that appears in the media, but one that goes on uh, constantly. And secondly, uh, the, the, those revolutions that have uh, been the least uh, violent and therefore the, the most well organized is those in which the revolutionary leadership and the revolutionary party was better prepared for for them and uh, they they came about with the least uh, blood, bloodshed. I mean, if you want to, we're not in favor of uh, bloodshed and violence per se. Uh, but we recognize that there will be a resistance on the part of the ruling uh, class and the way to minimize that resistance is for the forces of uh, revolutionary uh, masses to be better organized, better equipped and better led by a, rev by a leadership that knows where it's going and has fully learned the lessons of the, of the past. Because this is also what the revolutionary leadership, revolutionary party is, it's kind of a the historical memory of the working class, that the lessons learned from all the past, uh, uh, from all the past uh, struggles, and many defeats, and, and this is the reason, for instance, why Lenin, in the middle of middle of the Russian Revolution, it took some time to write State and Revolution, which is basically going through the Marxist theory of the of the state in order to be able to to implement this to, to as a useful. Uh, contribution to their own uh, immediate uh, uh, struggle. So this is the link between theory and, uh, and uh, practice. Uh, Joe, Joe has asked about the question of the unemployed. I will say that the, the unemployed are notoriously difficult section of the working class to organize because they're not in factories, they're not together, they don't work together, they're isolated, atomized. And, and, it's, and I will say that in a period like now, we, we don't have mass unemployment in, in Britain, but we have mass, certainly mass unemployment in Greece and in, <laughs> in Spain. I just read the latest figure for youth unemployment in Greece is, is nearly 62%. This is something that is even difficult to, to comprehend. In Spain, youth unemployment, I think, is now, uh, what is it, uh, I don't know, 53% of it, or over that figure. And, and uh, overall unemployment is 27%. In some, some regions in Spain, there are whole regions like Andalusia, Estrella, there was over 30%. Now, I, I will say that this the task, it should be the task of the trade unions and of revolutionary trade unionists within the trade unions to try to organize the unemployed. This, many of these unemployed were in jobs very short period uh, of, uh, very shortly uh, uh, before. Uh, in Spain, three million jobs have been destroyed. These people have had jobs before. They should be kept within the structures of the trade unions, organized through the trade unions so that they keep in touch with the class in general uh, and so on. That, that would be a revolutionary uh, policy. Demands should be raised, like the sharing out of working uh, hours with no loss of uh, pay, 
public works programs to give uh, uh, work for the unemployed and, and so on. But at the same time, we, we need to be uh, careful, and I think that this is also something that uh, Marie was uh, getting at, that uh, we are very small uh, organization, say we have three comrades at uh, Sussex uh, uh, University and, and a few here and a few uh, there. Our, our task is not to organize the unemployed, this is beyond uh, our, our forces and our uh, limitations. We shouldn't attempt it, but, but we should if, if this problem, problem arises in discussions in the local trade unions or amongst uh, local people, we should uh, offer an, an alternative and put forward some ideas on, on how, to, how to do it. There are historical experiences of the struggle against unemployment, organizing the unemployment, the, the unemployed uh, <coughs> movement in the 1920s and the 1930s, <coughs> so that we need to study and, uh, and uh, learn uh, uh, from. I will say that we not, we're not talking here, I mean, like, uh, it's ju just about uh, historical examples. Uh, sometimes it might seem that Marxists discuss revolutions that took place 100 years ago. It's not, no, nearly 100 years since the Russian uh, Revolution. Uh, it's, uh, what, 75 years since the Spanish uh, Revolution. But it's not just historical examples very far away. Historical examples from today also, also vindicate the, the validity of the ideas of Marxism. You just take, it's two years since the beginning of the Arab uh, Revolution. You take the Tunisian revolution, this is a classical revolution from a Marxist point of view. The participation of the working class, the role that the trade unions uh, played in it, the, the courage of the masses once they get on, on the move. Because you, you can say, yes, leaders are corruptible, but this is not just, this is just one characteristic of uh, human uh, nature. There's also other characteristics. For instance, uh, as seen in revolutionary times, people give, they prepare to give even their lives not for their own advancement, but for the collective advancement of the class they, be, they belong to. This is also this positive uh, aspects to human uh, nature, which come to the fore in these revolutionary times. In Tunisia, about 240 people were killed uh, in, in a process of a few uh, weeks. The mobilizations went from uh, strong to stronger to stronger. And in a short space of time, they overthrew a dictatorship that had been in place for, for many years, that had domination, that had a massive apparatus of secret services. It shows that the on the one hand, that the working class, once it gets it on the move, there's no force that can stop it. No repression, no manipulation of mass media, nothing. Uh, at the same time, two years later, conditions of the masses in uh, Tunisia have not fundamentally uh, changed. As a matter of fact, unemployment has uh, increased, there's inflation, there's mass poverty, and uh, so what it shows also is the need for a revolutionary leadership. At that time, had there been 200, 300,000, um, Tunisia is a small country of maybe 10 million uh, inhabitants, had there been a, a revolutionary organization of two, three uh, hundred, putting forward the correct slogans, the correct demands, pushing the revolution in the right di direction, there would have been socialist uh, transformation in, in Tunisia, which would have had a massive impact throughout the Arab world. The overthrow of Ali already was the spark for many other of these uh, revolutionary movements. Just imagine if they had as well overthrown capitalism, which was uh, entirely possible. There was no reason other than the lack of a revolutionary leadership. And for this reason, it's, it's so urgent and so important, the building of a revolutionary leadership in the countries where we work uh, today, where there maybe there isn't yet a fully-fledged revolutionary movement started, but all the conditions are pushing in that uh, direction. I'll give you one example. When, when we talk about changes in uh, consciousness, in Spain, for instance, there's now opinion polls that say that 88% of the population think that all institutions of uh, bourgeois democracy, they don't work. They're dissatisfied with the working. And the important thing is not so much that so, so many people, it's also that this was not the case five years ago, before the crisis started. People were more or less satisfied in, in, opinion, in same similar opinion polls with, uh, with the working of democracy. Recent, most recent one in Andalusia, they say that 85% are dissatisfied with the working, with the way democracy is working, uh, and five years ago it was only 30%. This is a massive shift in, in consciousness that's already taking uh, place through mass mobilizations, uh, their own daily experience of the crisis of, uh, of, uh, of capitalism, and this is already happening to, to a bigger or smaller degree in, in all countries in, uh, in the advanced capitalist uh, world. Massive shift in, 
in consciousness. They also ask people in Spain the follow if they agree or not, if they agreed or not with the following sentence. The, the, the impact of the crisis is being paid mainly by the middle class and those uh, with less uh, resources uh, and, and the rich are getting off without uh, any consequences. And 96% of the population said yes. And I guess the 4% are remaining is no, <laughs> the rich who benefited. But this is a big change in, uh, in uh, consciousness. Conditions are being created for a revolutionary explosion. And we're not ready for that yet. Uh, we, we need to build our organization to be able to intervene. And this change in conditions also ma makes that uh, uh, e easier. People, people uh, are, are more open to, discuss, to discussing this, uh, these uh, ideas. Revolutions do not take, revolutions, revolutionary periods do not happen every day, do not happen every year. They happen maybe once in a generation, once every two, two decades. Last time was in the 1960s and 70s, and there were revolutions. Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of advanced workers and youth moved towards revolutionary conclusions, attempted to transform society, and they were defeated. Uh, and these revolutions were derailed in one place after after another. And now there's a new wave started. Has already started. Started in, in, the, in the Latin American Revolution first. It moved to the Arab Revolution, and it's reaching the shores of, uh, of uh, Europe through the, through the Mediterranean Sea, in Greece, in Spain, in, uh, in uh, Italy, and, and so on. And I think that, if anything, ev every one of us in this uh, room, we should feel that we are privileged to live in this particular time, and to live in this particular time as conscious uh, Marxists, so that we can make a contribution, we can participate in changing <coughs> these uh, conditions, make a fundamental contribution to the revolutionary uh, transformation of society. I'll just fin finish by saying that I fully, fully agree with what Marie said. This is also an individual challenge for each one of, uh, of us. We are part of an, of an organization, and this is what gives us uh, our strength. But it's also up to each one of us to, one, uh, read uh, Marxist theory, discuss Marxist theory, educate ourselves, first of all, uh, second, to intervene in the movement, wherever we, we are. We are in a university, in a, in a high school, or in a workplace. Try to open up a discussion group. Then there must be one, two, three workmates, student uh, uh, colleagues, who are interested in these ideas. We need to find them, we need to start a discussion with them, and I'm sure we can uh, uh, convince them. And finally, because m many of the people in this uh, room, and majority, overwhelming majority of the comrades that we have won in the last period are young comrades, mostly uh, students, we need to try to find within the work that we do a way of linking with the working uh, class. And the most obvious uh, way to do this is in our own uh, university campuses, as, as, as Joe has explained. There will be struggles of university lecturers, of university staff, uh, there's been a big, a long ongoing struggle, say, of the cleaners at, the U, at UCL or SOAS, and this is the, the most immediate link that we can establish with the working class. Invite them to speak at student uh, meetings, go and support the uh, picket lines, try to build this, uh, these uh, links. But above all, uh, this is all part of one uh, task of building a Marxist, revolutionary, international, an organization composed of cadres that can understand and intervene in the situation a task that has never been more uh, necessary and for which there is a certain uh, uh, urgency. And uh, in the next few years, we will not only see and witness massive events take place, but, but I'm sure that we will intervene and we will play a key role in, uh, in making those events into a victory for our class nationally and internationally.